Hi, right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second plenary lecture. This is January 26, 2021, um, for Honors 291, the Montana course. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Rosalind Lapierre from the Environmental Studies Program, and she'll be speaking to us on Montana myth making. I'm going to pause the recording now until we're getting to get things started. Can you? So Rosalind, you are our first plenary speaker who's doing this via Zoom and we're, we're working through multiple means of technology um, in terms of how we can do it here. But we got your, your, your PowerPoint is showing on the screen here in the room. I'm gonna use the screen, the screen share function right now to make sure it shows up. Um, let's see. Actually, do you, you have it, you got it on the scare screen function. So let me just double check. Um, Folks, Emily or Doug, can you guys see the Montana mythology slide on PowerPoint? Good, we got a thumbs up on that. All right here. So as I mentioned before, this is the second of our plenary speakers and it's our first time we have two students who are gonna do the introductions. So I'm gonna invite Kennedy Ann and Savannah. You've got each microphones there that should be live at this point. Um, and I will turn the uh, camera on to you and. So Roz and they're gonna introduce you and then we will turn it over to you. And then when we get to the question and answer section, they'll help facilitate some of the discussion questions on that. Okay, hi, I'm Kennedy and I'm just gonna introduce. So Rosalind Lapierre is an associate professor here at the University of Montana. She is an award-winning winning indigenous writer, has a degree in physics and a PhD in environmental history. And she's also an ethnobotanist and environmental activist and is working to support indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge. She uses this traditional ecological knowledge to address environmental justice and climate crisis within indigenous communities. She also works to strengthen public policy of indigenous languages, both locally and nationally. She's an enrolled member of the Blackfeet tribe of Montana and her lecture tonight is called Montana Mythmaking. So got a quick question. Awesome. Were you able to pick up that with the, and the microphones in the background there? Yes, I could. Very good. All right. Then I think we are ready to turn things over to you. So I will turn it over to Dr. Rosalyn Lapierre on Montana mythology. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to um, your class. And uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, first, for technology purposes, Please feel free to interrupt me if there's a technological issue and, and uh, ask me to, um, if something freezes or I need to stop and say something over again, um, that's not a problem. So please feel free to just uh, interrupt me um, and tell me if there's an issue. Um, so today I actually wanna start um, with a long quote, um, but it's a quote from Terry Temptis Williams who is a well-known um, environmental writer and an environmental activist. And this is a quote from her previous book um, called The Hour of Land. And I will read it for you. Um, but the question at the bottom that's in red um, is a question that I want people to think about and consider um, as I talk today. And then as we get towards the end of um, my presentation um, for us to think about um, as, as a um, kind of a resonating question. So the creation of America's national parks has been the creation of myths. I grew up with the myth that when Yellowstone National Park was established in 1872, it was void of people. No one told me that our first national park was the seasonal and cyclical home of Blackfeet, Bannock, Shoshone, and Crow Nations and that these nations had been inhabited, oh, and that these lands had been inhabited by people for 10,000 years. Like any good story with the muscle of privilege behind it, it seemed believable. And I never asked the question, who benefits from the telling of this particular story? So one way I would actually reframe that too is who benefits from the telling of this particular myth? Um, so today I'm going to kind of um, talk about three kind of separate things. One is I'm going to start with talking about Blackfeet worldview so that you get a sense of 
how the Blackfeet think about the universe and the world that they live in. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about indigenous land use before contact. Um, and then also kind of a little bit about the American myth of wilderness. And of course, this was um, partly what your um, readings were about uh, and, and the podcast as well. So I'm really going to spend probably about two thirds um, to three fourths of my talk kind of on Blackfeet worldview um, and indigenous land use and kind of that tail end, um, just reminding us um, of the idea of the concept of wilderness um, as an American myth um, that is in contradiction with um, indigenous um, stories about themselves and, and their own um, uh, myths. So hopefully you can see um, this map and the colors on this map um, because the colors represent uh, different indigenous groups um, that lived, have lived historically in what is now Montana. And so the Blackfeet, um, which I'm a member of the Blackfeet tribe, are in this central portion of, the, of this map, which is kind of purple. Um, the Blackfeet historically um, have lived in uh, central, what is now central Montana, um, what is also central um, Alberta and Saskatchewan. So the Blackfeet are a tribe, as are many tribes that border, um, that have um, tribal members on both sides of the Canadian border and the United States border. Um, there are also a lot of tribes that are on um, the United States and the Mexican border. Um, so the Blackfeet have three reserves, which they call them reserves up in Canada, three reserves in Canada and one reservation in the United States. The Blackfeet um, are actually very fortunate to continue um, to live in their traditional territory. That is not true for a lot of indigenous people um, in North America who were removed or pushed um, out of their traditional territories and now are living um, in other um, indigenous people's territories. Um, but um, the majority of tribes, not all of them, but the majority of tribes in what is now Montana um, continue to live in their traditional territories um, and a few do not, but we're not talking about that today. Um, but I'm just sharing this map to give you a sense of where the Blackfeet historically um, uh, called their traditional territory. So as I mentioned, I actually wanted to start by talking about Blackfeet worldview. And by worldview, I mean sort of their religious understanding of how they think about the universe and cosmology and how that works. So the Blackfeet um, believe that there are three separate worlds um, and that these separate worlds interact with each other uh, and that there's kind of this long history, this long story behind these three worlds. And I'm just gonna stop there for a second and compare it very quickly to Christianity. Um, Christianity as a religion also believes in three worlds. So in the Christian um, tradition, there is a belief that there's uh, heaven. Um, there's also a belief that there's earth and there's a belief that there's hell, right? And that these three worlds interact with each other um, and that there are humans who lack supernatural power but there are other entities, both in heaven and in hell, who, who do have supernatural power. Um, and so the Blackfeet have a similar kind of system um, of, of uh, understanding their universe and cosmology. And this is unique to them. Um, they had this system before contact and different um, indigenous groups have different ideas, right? About how they believe the universe works. So the Blackfeet believe um, that there's an above world, um, which is all things that are in the sky and um, kind of in the cosmos, that there's a what they call a quote unquote below world, which is everything that's here on earth, um, and the water world, which is everything that lives underwater. Um, and that in all three of these places, um, there are lots of different entities, right? There are people, there are plants, there are animals, um, there are other types of elements um, that we consider what we would consider part of the natural world. There's also a lot of supernatural entities in all three of these worlds. So, for example, you know, there's giants 
Um, there's little people, there's monsters, um, there's good monsters, there's bad monsters. Um, and so when you learn about um, the Blackfeet um, history and stories of themselves, you're gonna learn about all of these different people and entities that live in these three different realms. Um, and it is something that um, not only do the Blackfeet believe of in those three realms, but they also have an understanding of how earth um, and our uh, natural world and landscape work, which I'll mention in just a minute. So very briefly, um, the Blackfeet do believe that there are uh, persons who live in these three different realms. So there's the Spumatapi, which are people who live in the sky world. There's the Sakomatapi, which are earth beings. Um, there's the Nitsatapi, which are humans um, or the original people. And there's the Suitapis who live as under, who are underwater beings. And these are all um, what we would consider quote unquote persons um, that uh, interact with each other. Um, humans, similar to kind of the Christian viewpoint, humans in Blackfeet worldview lack supernatural uh, power. Um, so humans have to always um, ally themselves with other supernatural entities um, for them to move between worlds. So the Blackfeet do believe that humans can live in the sky world, that humans can live in the underwater world, and that humans live here on earth. Um, and that humans uh, want to, um, as part of the belief system, they want to ally themselves with other supernatural entities um, because it just makes them have a better life. Um, they don't have to if they don't want to. So the Blackfeet don't have like a quote unquote religion that they have to practice or be part of if they don't want to, um, but they do, but there is um, uh, ceremonies and rituals um, that they can participate in if they want to. Um, the Blackfeet have a very, um, part of their belief system is that it's very individualistic. So individuals get to choose whether or not they wanna be part of this larger system or not, or if they just wanna live their lives as a human, um, kind of disconnected from the rest of these other entities that exist. Okay, so one of the things you have probably heard about um, uh, most indigenous people, and I would say in the Americas, not in other parts of the world, um, is that indigenous people for the most part have oral, what we call oral tradition or oral history or oral stories, um, because for the most part, there were not written languages. Um, they had writing, um, but it was not in uh, the same way that we have um, the, the alphanumeric system that we have um, as part of English. Um, so they did have um, a history and um, kind of, again, mythology that they passed down um, from generation to generation. And one of the ways that they did this was through memorizing it. And um, they had various strategies to memorize um, their history. Uh, and it was usually memorized in um, what I call like, you know, units or chunks uh, of information at a time. Um, and it was done in a lot of different ways. And I, on my slide, you can see all of the, the list of different ways um, that people memorized um, information. This is done in a lot of cultures around the world um, where uh, that can be um, an oral based um, culture. And it is something that um, even people who do not have an oral um, tradition uh, continue to use these kinds of methods to memorize large uh, pieces of information. So one of the, a couple of the things that I wanna focus on um, today is um, a couple of different types of mnemonic devices that were used um, by the Blackfeet um, and also how the land and landscape was used as a text. Um, so let me uh, give an example. So this is a picture of a Blackfeet teepee um, that was taken at the turn of the last century. And hopefully you can see the colors um, in this, but one of the things you'll see is that um, at the top of the teepee, it's painted black, and there's some kind of symbolism up there. At the bottom of the teepee, it's painted red. Um, and then in the middle, it's kind of left unpainted. So 
a Blackfeet teepee had several purposes. So the, the first, of course, is that people lived in it, right? So it was a place where people lived. Um, but it was also a mnemonic device. Um, and so teepees had several different stories written on the teepee um, that were then um, shared um, through the, out the entire community. So the entire community memorized and knew all of these stories that told the history and the mythology of the Blackfeet themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things you'll see is at the top of the teepee, it's painted black and that kind of represents the night sky. Um, there are three different stories that are painted on most teepees um, of the Blackfeet. Um, so on the back of this particular teepee, you can see what looks like kind of a cross um, that's a symbol for the morning star, uh, which is Venus, the planet Venus. And then on the front of the teepee, which you can't see in this photo, are two different constellations uh, that the Blackfeet have these long you know, stories about their history um, and their connection to um, the Blackfeet and why they're on um, uh, every single teepee. Um, on the bottom of this particular teepee, and it's similar again to um, most Blackfeet teepees, it's painted red and the red represents um, the earth. Uh, and you'll see a couple of different symbols on the bottom. And again, it's on, uh, it's ubiquitous uh, to you know, most Blackfeet teepees. So it's painted red at the bottom for, to represent the earth. You see the round circles that are on the bottom um, and those represent two different things. Um, so they represent both um, stars that have fallen to earth, but also they represent um, a puffball fungus that you find out on the prairies. Um, and there's a story that connects a puffball fungus with stars that have fallen to earth. You'll also see on this particular teepee, um, uh, there's kind of a geometric form that kind of looks like a triangular shape that goes all the way around. Um, that represents mountains, but you can also see on other teepees, they'll have a rounded form, which represents the prairies. Um, then, so that's kind of uh, the basic teepee design for the Blackfeet. And so historically, you know, most Blackfeet would be able to tell you all the stories that rep are represented just on this teepee, from the story of the fallen stars, which is a story about this um, character called Star Child and his mother, who's, wh whose name is um, uh, uh, Feather Woman. She marries a star person, um, goes up to live in the sky world, um, gets pregnant, has a child who's half human and half sky person, comes back to Earth. Anyway, there's kind of a long um, story about these uh, two people. But, and then on the top of the teepee, again, there's several stories, including two different constellations and another star. So these are stories that everybody in the community would know and everybody in the community would have memorized. And the way they would memorize them was through knowing what the designs on the teepee were. And so a teepee is um, again, both a place where people would live, but also it's a very large mnemonic device, right? Um, so the Blackfeet had a lot of different mnemonic devices that they used to um, be able to uh, memorize their history, memorize their stories, and then be able to then teach the next generation what those stories were. <clears throat> So one of the other places that the Blackfeet used as a method of memorizing their history and their stories was actually the landscape itself. So let me, I'll just give you an, so this is a photo of an area that's kind of near, um, it's in the Missouri River Breaks, uh, which is kind of right in central, what is now central Montana. So historically, the Blackfeet had a name for most places on the landscape. So they had names for um, most of the mountains. They had names for many of the hills and buttes. They had names for all of the rivers and creeks. They oftentimes had names for a lot of groves of trees. Um, and they also had names for places, um, for example, spring 
um, uh, springs that were in the middle of um, the prairies um, and other places. So let me go back for a second. So there was lots of different ways that the landscape was used as a text. So in one, um, one example is it was used as a historic text. So the types of stories that were told about a particular place were things where you know, a historic event happened or where a, a famous person um, had been uh, there. Uh, they also told stories about places because of their resource use. Um, so oftentimes there would be a name of a river, right? Or, or of a, a grove of trees. You know, this is where we get ash wood, for example. Um, they used ash uh, for, a, because it's a hard wood, um, for a lot of different tool making. Um, and then the other thing that they used the land for was as a sacred, oh, excuse me. The other thing they used uh, the land for is as a sacred text. So there was also a, um, there's also a, uh, in addition to kind of the historic stories, they also had stories about their, this uh, worldview that they had, um, their belief system, and particular places on the landscape um, that were connected to these different worlds. And so in addition to the name of the place, most places also had songs and stories, um, and sometimes an object, which was again, a kind of a mnemonic device. And together between all of these different things, between the place name, the song, the story, sometimes a prayer as well, and the object, they memorized all of the places on the landscape. So if you were traveling with somebody who knew all of these stories and all of these places, they could easily recite it, literally like opening up a book, right? They could just open up the book and say, oh, we're here. Such and such happened here. Here's the story that went with it. Here's the, the song. Oh, such and such happened over here. And they had the entire land and landscape memorized um, by place name, by story, by song, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things, and I'll just mention this here, but I, I was gonna mention it later as well. So one of the things that happened over time is when um, because of American colonization and um, because of the loss of land um, that the Blackfeet and other tribes had, one of the things they lost, not just land and not just resources, they also lost a lot of their history and their sacred knowledge because some of that was attached to these places. And um, if you're not being told the stories over and over again um, about these places, then sometimes that knowledge gets lost. Um, and so even though now people live on the reservation for the most part, and they have like all the places memorized on the reservation, that might not be true for other places that are now off reservation. And people who still remember those stories continue to tell them. When I grew up, for example, we would drive from the Blackfeet Reservation, we would drive from Browning to Great Falls, right, to go grocery shopping. And along the way, I would hear my grandmother and grandfather tell story after story after story of each place. At this place, this happened. At this place, that happened. And um, I now today have those stories memorized only because I heard them so many times and because we went to them, right? So we went to those places along the way. Um, and so that's how that, that um, oral tradition and oral knowledge gets passed down. So very quickly, um, we know um, now uh, every year uh, uh, scholars and scientists do research on you know, when uh, indigenous people have been here in the Americas, how long they've been here. And the latest kind of numbers at this point, Nature Magazine um, uh, uh, um, published a story this summer um, about the latest research, which they believe that uh, people have been in the Americas between 30 and 33,000 years ago. And um, this map that I'm showing you right here is actually from Nat National Geographic. And National Geographic has some great maps um, that they have created over time. Um, mapping um, the story of human 
um, uh, human migration to the Americas. And one of the things that they believe at this point is that people came to the Americas primarily by sea and primarily by, originally by probably watercraft. Um, and so they went along, as you can see in this map, they went along the edges um, of, uh, of North America, um, traveling um, probably by boat or canoe uh, and then populated um, North America. They eventually also then came uh, by walking once, um, once the ice sheet um, receded. Okay, so I wanted to just show that to you to get a to give you a sense of um, when people uh, the latest kind of science um, regarding when folks um, arrived here. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about kind of indigenous land use and indigenous land divisions. So very similar to other groups around the world, you know, indigenous people in North America um, had claimed territory. So I think there's kind of a stereotype that indigenous people like didn't like, um, you know, claim land or landscape, they did. Uh, uh, they claimed territory and usually the territory was divided by natural um, divisions. So usually it was from, you know, river to river or uh, mountains out here to uh, a river or a lake. Um, so there was usually some sort of natural division between groups. Um, so people did actually claim territory. Oftentimes um, there were what are now called buffer zones between um, groups. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in just a bit about um, uh, how buffer zones were used as part of um, what we call holy lands or sacred lands. Um, so buffer zones were areas where often people didn't live um, because they were a zone between um, uh, human groups. And so oftentimes buffer zones became areas that were really rich in biodiversity because those were places um, that had a lighter footprint, so to speak, uh, by humans. And then the other thing to recognize is that uh, most land um, in North America was either managed land, lands or landscape or unmanaged. And that was intentional. Um, and so there wasn't, um, when we think about North America, you need to think about it as a place where there were humans all the way across what is now the United States and Canada and Mexico. Um, and that, that those lands and landscapes were heavily used. Um, and in the places where they were not used, they were usually not used intentionally. Okay, so um, the way that indigenous people actually use land is very similar to the way we do today, right? So um, there were places that were uh, villages or towns or even cities um, where, where indigenous people lived and then kind of in the outskirts, what we consider, right, the suburbs, kind of outside um, of villages or towns, people lived. And in those cases, those places where people had continued occupation. They were, you know, the same way we live today. They're always there. Um, then there were areas that were outside of those places or between like towns or between uh, villages um, that were used primarily for resource use, right? So people would go out and uh, collect wood. People would go out and go hunting um, and they would leave specific areas um, to have a lighter footprint because those were places that were used for resources. Then there was the third, what I just mentioned, case where there were buffer zones um, between groups. And that had very limited use um, because um, they were used as areas to uh, reduce conflict um, between groups. Um, and then a, a fourth type of land use were lands that were considered sacred or holy. And oftentimes that land um, was either not used at all, and I'll explain this in a minute, or it had very limited use. Um, and so one of the things that I wanna highlight here when talking about indigenous land use is to recognize that indigenous people um, in their own territories, they knew all of the land in their territory. And they quote, I use it in quotes, and they used all of the land in their territory. So um, even if their land, that part of their land was a sacred site or a sacred area, that was still a use, even though they weren't living there um, or collecting um, resources from that, that particular spot. So I, um, I state this to um, 
uh, remind you th um, that indigenous people um, really didn't have a concept of what we have in America, kind of an empty space or wild lands, um, because all of their land was used for some particular purpose. Um, I think the only thing that might come close, and we can talk about this kind of at the end um, of the presentation, the only thing that might come co close to what we would consider like wilderness area is what indigenous people would consider um, sacred land. Um, or, whole, or a holy, holy areas. Okay, so I want to talk about sacred land for a little bit. So there's two types of sacred land. On this slide is one type, and the next slide will be another type. So there are sacred lands or holy lands that are created by the divine, right? That are they're created by the gods or the supernatural. Um, and so, how do humans interact, right, with those places? So here's a couple of different examples. So um, the first example is that humans don't go to these places, right? So there may be a place where a supernatural entity or a supernatural being lives. Um, and because there's an entity living there, um, humans don't go there. So the humans give them their space. Um, and these are often um, places, I mean, well, I shouldn't say often, they can be lots of different types of places. Um, they can be mountains, they can be hills, it could be a river, it could be a, gro a grove of trees. Um, but these places are known and there's kind of, you know, an imaginary boundary around that place um, so that humans don't go to that place because they're allowing the supernatural entity to live there um, undisturbed. Um, then there are sacred areas that, okay, I guess I should say um, think about this as a target, right? So in the in the middle of the target, you kind of have your sacred place where, again, a supernatural entity might live there, which is why you're not going there. But then kind of on that next rim around um, where the supernatural entity lives um, is usually a place that is also considered sacred, but it's a place where humans can go, but they don't live there. Um, so it's a place where you'd go to visit. Um, so it might be a place where people would go to pray. It might be a place where people go to uh, for a vision quest or even a ritual or a ceremony. But it's some place where they would be near a supernatural um, entity, but they would not be disturbing that supernatural entity. Um, and then related to that as well is there may be places um, where indigenous people would go to collect particular types of items or objects that they use as part of their ceremonial practice or religious practice. Um, and they would go to a place either near um, a supernatural entity or a place that had been sanctified for some reason by a supernatural entity. Um, so they would go um, and collect, for example, you know, sweet grass or sage, and they would go to a very particular place to get that material. Um, to be used to use but then they wouldn't use that land for other purposes right they wouldn't um, live there um, that's the only resource that they would collect from there so when um, the blackfeet and other indigenous people talk about this place is sacred there's usually a reason why that particular place is sacred it's you know again it's being used as kind of collecting resources it's a place for prayer or somebody actually lives there Okay, then there's another type of sacred land. Um, there's also sacred land that's created by humans. So this is a different type of sacred land. Um, and uh, there's again, several examples. And these are very similar to examples that we have today in our own communities. So for example, one sacred place um, might be a place where humans are buried, like a cemetery, right? Uh, we don't live at cemeteries, we visit cemeteries, but we don't live there. Um, this is the same uh, for indigenous people um, and for the Blackfeet historically. Um, there are also places that may have been created and built. So a shrine that's built for prayer, um, a particular place uh, like a, um, on the Northern Great Plains, there are a lot of stone effigies and stone medicine wheels that were also created for religious purposes, like a ceremony or a ritual. Um, again, you would go there 
um, for a particular purpose, usually prayer or a ceremony, um, but you don't stay there and you don't live there. Um, and then one of the other places is that for the Blackfeet, at least, the Blackfeet actually build certain um, uh, buildings um, for a ritual or for a ceremony. And then after the ceremony is over, they leave. Um, and so they may use that particular space or that particular um, structure that they just built for several days or even several weeks. But then when the ceremony is over, they leave and they uh, wait for um, nature to allow that um, natural that structure to disintegrate. And while that is happening, um, they don't return. They they leave that um, particular uh, place alone. And so there are actually are places on the landscape even today. If you were to go to the Blackfeet Reservation, you will find places where you'll see a structure just kind of out in the field, and you're like, hey, what is that? And it's some place. It's a place that where there had been a ceremony um, and the ceremony's over and now they're waiting for that to um, kind of disintegrate back to earth. So those are kind of the two different types of um, holy places, right? Holy and sacred places that are created by, um, by uh, humans and holy places that are created by the divine. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, because um, when you look at how indigenous people think of the land and landscape, um, they are seeing all these, these multiple uses um, between um, places where you live, places where you get resources, and places um, that are sacred um, to them. And so I just wanted to um, sort of go back uh, uh, to remind you sort of the Blackfeet do believe in kind of three realms. Um, and in all of these three realms, whether it's the sky world, whether it's here on earth, whether it's the underwater world, that there really was a belief system that there was sort of no empty space and there was no unused space. So there was some use happening at all times in all of this land and landscape, again, depending on where it was in what realm. Um, and so um, I want to sort of give that as a framework for understanding um, the Blackfeet idea of, of uh, both kind of a supernatural realm, but also a natural realm. Um, and then what happens when the Americans arrive. Okay. So this is a map as you can see from 1802. Um, and this is one of the maps that Lewis and Clark used um, when they came out to um, this region uh, of North America. And one of the things that you can notice from seeing this map is if you look at this big green line right in the middle, um, that's the Mississippi River. Um, so um, east of the Mississippi, um, you can see that it is kind of penciled in. Um, they have a pretty good idea of what the land looks like um, east of the Mississippi, because at that point, um, the United States of America had sort of made its way kind of to the middle of North America. But once you got to the Mississippi and kind of went beyond, they pretty much had um, no idea uh, what was going on um, past there. And so when, the, when Lewis and Clark first went out, um, to what would become Montana, um, they're coming with a blank uh, map. Um, and one of the things I want to uh, mention, and again, you guys uh, saw some of this in, your, in the readings um, that, you, that you read, um, this idea of having a blank map um, is very much part of American um, culture and, and American history. Um, and even though at that time, um, people knew that there were indigenous people here. Uh, there was also an idea that indigenous people didn't have a sense of territory, didn't have a sense of land or landscape, and didn't have a sense of ownership, right? Um, and, um, and that's definitely not true, not the case. Okay, so in the 19th century is the time when Americans first come out to this area that is now, that, that, that is now Montana. Um, and it really is with the um, uh, exploration of Lewis and Clark 
uh, at the beginning of the 19th century um, that was uh, uh, engineered um, by Thomas Jefferson um, to, and so let me stop for just one second. So Thomas Jefferson, when, oops, when we look at this map, um, and everyone knows, you know, from, I don't know, what, elementary school or middle school, like Louisiana Purchase, uh, yada, 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 uh, that um, Thomas Jefferson um, organized two different expeditions. One went north and one went south. Okay, the one that went north we hear about, right, Lewis and Clark, because, um, because it was successful. Um, we do not hear about the southern one. <laughs> because it was not successful. So there was actually a, 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 an expedition that went south. Um, they didn't make it really past what is now um, Louisiana because um, the tribes that were there just said, uh -uh, you're not going any further. Um, and so they didn't. Okay, so this is why we know the Lewis and Clark expedition. Okay, so Lewis and Clark were really um, just, uh, were really interested uh, more in science um, than anything else. I'm not going to say much about that, but they were, uh, you know, very much part of the Enlightenment sci um, science at that time in, in the early 19th century. Um, they really were there to gather information. Um, so they, they collected a lot of information about the people they encountered, about the plants, the animals, um, all of the natural features um, along the way. And part of it was for capital, um, part of it was for capitalism um, and the economy, the rising economy of um, the United States um, and, um, uh, and, and commerce. And, um, and then some of it was, um, a lot of it was for science and trying to understand um, what the Americans um, thought of as kind of new um, places um, that they had um, not been to. Okay, but what, one of the things, and I'm just gonna be brief about this, because again, um, this is what our readings were about um, this week and what our sort of discussion in class is going to be about. Um, you know, one of the other things that uh, uh, the Americans brought with them as they moved across um, North America was also this idea of um, wilderness, um, which was, um, new to indigenous people um, and but it was a it was both kind of an ideology and a philosophy that evolved um, throughout the 19th century it actually kind of began before that but we're not going to get into that um, but throughout the 19th century um, it really evolved um, from being a discussion um, of thinking of wild places and the wilderness as places that are uh, fearful and evil, um, as we saw um, in um, the Bible and in Genesis. So if for those of you who remember the Genesis story of the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden is this wonderful place, and then kind of off outside of the Garden of Eden is quote unquote, the wild and wilderness, right? And it's considered um, kind of dark, fearful and evil. Um, so the idea of the wild was something it, at least in kind of the Christian uh, European tradition, which then became the American tradition um, as something that was considered fearful, right? But throughout the 19th century that completely kind of changed, right? It flipped from one side to the other of being um, a place that was considered fearful to being a place that was considered where you would go to find God. Um, and it was um, during this process of thinking about um, the, la the land as both sort of empty, um, the land as sort of more um, uh, that places that were uh, empty and wild were superior, uh, that we then um, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, we um, emerge as a nation to develop both kind of the preservation movement and the conservation movement, which would eventually evolve into the um, environmental movement. Um, and the way that we think about land and landscape in America. And as you know from your readings, you know, one of the tenets of this American myth is that um, these places that we in America think of as wild or wilderness 
are actually places where people live. Um, and that the people who live there have a different idea about the use of that particular land or what that land had been used for. Um, and so one of the things we see happening um, today in the 21st century is that this idea, this 19th century idea of wilderness is now all the way, you know, been dragged into the 21st century. Um, and it still impacts um, the public policy that we have. It still impacts our relationships um, with indigenous people. It still impacts our own personal understanding, right, um, of uh, how we should be relating to the natural world um, when we think that there is such a thing as wilderness. Um, when uh, we know from, well, we know from history, but we just, um, we know in general that it is, a, it is something that was constructed um, and created um, in the 19th century um, as part of kind of this um, religious um, uh, belief system that evolved um, throughout kind of that, that hundred years. Um, so one of the things, again, um, that I wanted um, people to think about um, and, um, and focus on is thinking about this idea of who benefits from telling any particular story, right? Or who benefits from telling a particular myth about themselves. Um, in the United States, and again, I'm an environmental historian, in the United States, we have a lot of myths about ourselves, as do a lot of countries. Um, and oftentimes those myths serve a very positive purpose and sometimes they don't. Um, and so one of the questions becomes, when, at what point is a myth something that's positive for um, a, na a nation? And when do we need to be more critical of that myth and think about it in a different way? So um, think about that for a moment. I'm gonna do one last slide. Um, okay, so this is, a, I've thrown a lot of dates at you right here. Um, so this is a list of dates um, of um, sharing how did what we now call Montana become Montana, right? How did it go from indigenous land to becoming the state of Montana? And this evolved in the, mostly in the 19th century. Um, and it happened actually rather quickly. So by the mid 19th century in 1855, um, 1855 was the first time that um, the United States government uh, went across um, what is now Montana um, and signed treaties with the tribes um, that were here. And it went from uh, the West Coast to the East Coast. So um, they're called the Stevens Treaties because um, Governor Isaac Stevens um, from Washington actually brokered all of these treaties. And he actually started from the Puget Sound um, near Seattle. And he went from the Puget Sound and kind of worked his way west, right, from, you know, uh, Washington State to then kind of what is now Idaho to what is now Montana. And uh, the Stevens treaties were actually just a treaty um, to some, some of them were for peace, um, but actually some of them were actually just to build roads um, and to uh, create a transportation corridor. Okay. Um, when things really changed in what is now the state of Montana was when gold was found. So gold was found um, in 1862 um, in Ban what is now Bannock, Montana, which is kind of south of Dillon um, or near Dillon, uh, Montana. Uh, and then very shortly after gold was found in Bannock, it was found in Hel what is now Helena um, and other places. And one of the reasons I want to, I'm sharing this, I'm not going to go over all the dates, FYI. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons I'm sharing this list of dates is just to give you a sense of when did Montana become Montana um, and to give you some historic context. Any state across what is now the United States um, became a state and became a territory because something specifically happened before it became that. So Montana becomes a territory very shortly after gold is found. So gold is found in Montana 
um, in what is now Montana. And so um, the, uh, the political, um, uh, 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 the folks that were, I guess, in Washington state, because Washington state was a territory, um, uh, led the charge to make Montana a territory because then they could control the mineral um, and the natural resources um, as a, uh, again, as kind of the rise of capitalism was happening. Um, okay, fast forward, um, when does Montana become a state? So the United States government ha actually based on British common law um, has actually tried to um, sign treaties with tribes to legally um, be able to um, claim land. This doesn't off happen all the way across the United States, and it actually didn't happen with all of the lands in the state of Montana. So there's some lands in the state of Montana that were actually taken illegally um, by the United States government. Um, but the US government did try to sign treaties with most of the tribes in the state of Montana to acquire land, um, quote unquote, legally. <laughs> so the majority of the state of Montana, remember the map um, that I showed you earlier, the purple, the Blackfeet tribe owned kind of like the northern portion of um, the state of Montana. Um, the Blackfeet tribe still owned the northern portion of the state of Montana until 1888. Um, in 1888, um, an agreement was signed, um, but it was actually signed um, and agreed to in Congress before the Blackfeet even saw it. Um, so uh, again, kind of the political powers and the capitalistic powers that that were existed um, in Montana territory at that time wanted Montana to become a state. It could not become a state unless they quote unquote owned most of the land in Montana. Um, and so at that time, the Blackfeet actually owned most of the land in the state of Montana. And then in 1888, there was a um, agreement um, that was um, agreed to in Congress, then they brought it back to Montana. Um, the Blackfeet, the Grovan, the Assiniboine, um, who else am I missing? I think that's it. Um, uh, oh, yeah, it signed, quote unquote, signed it um, and agreed to it. And then a year later, uh, Montana became a state. Um, and they could only be, again, they could only become a state when they kind of owned most of the land um, that is in the state of Montana. So anyway, so that I've just, Say, sharing that with you, um, because most people don't think of um, when we talk about Montana, they think Montana has existed forever. Um, Montana became a state not that long ago, only in 1889. Um, so before that, when you're in this class and as you're writing papers and things like that, especially if you're talking before 1889 or maybe even 1864, um, so I always try to say, um, what we now call Montana or the land that used, you know, that is now Montana um, because it wasn't Montana um, before then. So I think I'm going to end there um, and it opened it up for questions and comments. Um, so thank you everyone for being attentive and um, let me stop this share here. So thanks. All right. Well, let's first give Ron Rosen a round of applause here. Thank you. So much. Raza, I'm going to see if I can um, get the, um, the cameras viewed on here. And I've got um, Kennedy Ann and Savannah are going to ask the first questions here. So if you want to go to one of the microphones there and speak within two or three inches of the mic so people can really hear you on that. And then we'll start opening it up for um, other people who. There, if you have a question, just feel free to come up to one of the one of the mics there, and then uh, and then we'll open it up for a further conversation. And I'll just add, it does not have to be a question; it can be a comment or or an ob an observation. Um, yeah. Very good. Yeah, um, I have a question that I got from the reading, and I noticed that I looked over a lot of the questions from other classmates, and they kind of had the same question just sort of about how we learn a lot about the environmentalists of America who came up with the different ideas about wilderness and have a lot of different writings that we study and have um, founded a lot of clubs and like the Audubon Society but they have a lot of um, racist and 
history with white supremacy. And so I was just wondering, um, like how come we haven't like, I guess we acknowledge it in class, but how come there's still clubs and things that are like so many things named after them? Nothing has changed regarding that. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I guess they, if you took a class with me, you'd never read any of those people because I don't, I don't ever have my students read them. Um, uh, so I, I think that um, this is true of a lot of American history, right? So, um, and again, I'm sure that folks in class kind of know this already. Um, and you've probably heard these, um, you know, kind of cliche uh, statements, right? The winners write the history, right? That's kind of a cliche statement. Um, so, you know, the majority of US history that is, um, has been written that, ha that is of value um, is history that has been written um, primarily um, by uh, white men of privilege. Um, so not all, not all white men, but white men of privilege, white men um, who had um, property, um, who were wealthy. Um, and they told their a version um, of the story. Um, sometimes that story was true, sometimes it wasn't. Um, and um, and uh, it isn't until um, I would argue, you know, probably in the last, um, since the 1970s, 1980s, that there are more um, historians that come from a broader, um, uh, you know, a, a broader population um, who are uh, interested in telling a lot of these um, stories. Um, and so because of that, um, we have a better sense of our own uh, history as a country. Um, and I think that one of the things that's important um, as an environmental historian, but I think it's also important for students to, to, to learn is that, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that's great about scholarship is that you can um, tell a new interpretation. Um, you, can, you can do the research and you can look at um, some of the stories and um, retell them um, with a new understanding. Um, and, and I think that because we have a newer, um, uh, a newer community, again, of you know, scholars from a broad range um, of backgrounds, and we're learning uh, new stories that are there. You know, you just go to the archives and you can find find this information. Um, and uh, and so, I think that some of this it will eventually. And you, I mean, obviously, you guys are learning it now. I mean, some of the articles you read for this week um, are sharing or, or you know shining some light right on some of this history. Um, I think that some of this will eventually make it um, kind of into uh, um, the mainstream um, beyond, you know, a few of us who kind of know this, these stories already. Um, uh, but I think, uh, but I think you're right. So, I mean, I think that there are some, okay, part, part two kind of of your question is like, you know, there's these clubs that still have, you know, are using the names of some of these people who are now uncovering that kind of like, mm, I don't know about, you know, like they don't have the best uh, uh, um, um, story about them. Um, and I think that that's changing. I mean, I think that's changing and I think it will be changing um, in the next generation um, for sure. So. Thank you, Rosalind. I think Savannah has a question at the one microphone here as well. Um, so Speak mine's real close, my Savannah. Kind of from the reading, but um, you were talking about how like the creation of national parks impacted like indigenous women specifically. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. So yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so I thought that was FYI. I mean, I thought that that was a really great podcast um, that was, that those guys did. Um, which is why um, I asked um, folks to uh, um, listen to it. You can also read it because it's a it's a transcript. It was a really good podcast that those um, two producers were really interested in trying to tell that story of how 
they were using the term um, fortress conservation, right? Um, how fortress conservation is impacting different communities. And one of the things that I wanted to share was that um, oftentimes when there are these um, policies uh, that impact um, indigenous communities, not just here in the United States, but around the world, is that it does often impact um, different members of the community um, and it can also impact different generations, right? So depending on how people use resources or practice religion, um, they may, so in my case, I was telling the story of how, um, you know, some of the uh, regulations that the National Park Service has about gathering um, plants impact um, indigenous women more than indigenous men because um, at least for the Blackfeet, um, you know, the majority of uh, plant gathering, whether it's for medicinal and edible purposes or religious purposes are done by women and young girls um, versus hunting. Hunting is primarily done by men, right? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a gender kind of distinction. Um, there's also, again, like I said, a kind of a distinction uh, along generational lines as well, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, I think it does, some of those um, rules do impact women more uh, uh, than men. And, um, and I wanted to highlight that because I think that oftentimes um, the National Park Service doesn't recognize that. Um, and um, the US government doesn't quite recognize that. that uh, and, um, but within the community, um, community people recognize that. Um, and they see how um, there are, uh, when, we're, when we think about um, transferring knowledge to the next generation and teaching the next generation, about some of this type of traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge um, that oftentimes it is done in some places that indigenous people don't have access to that land anymore. Um, or for example, it's in a national park. Um, and often that learning is done um, from, uh, uh, from elder women um, to younger women. Uh, and, um, and so, they're the ones that are impacted um, oftentimes um, by uh, some of these policies. And um, the national parks are getting better, but they have actually at times can be quite forceful um, uh, and uh, stop people <laughs> from, from using, um, using national parks as places to gather uh, plants. Let me open it up and see, are there other folks who, we've got a couple mics here, if there are people who want to come forward and, and ask a question at this point or make a comment. Uh, yeah, Quinn, go ahead and walk, walk over to the microphone here. And again, you need to speak within about two or three inches of the mic to make sure it really picks you up. If you would just say your name and then ask your, or your question or comment. Hi, my name is Quinn. Um, so you just spoke on how these stories are passed orally um, through these ceremonies. And during, in the reading, uh, I remember reading part about um, the significance of the beaver. I was wondering, are some of these stories starting to get passed uh, through like written texts or is that kind of taboo mm -hmm. in the culture? Uh, so I would say it depends. So it depends on the indigenous community. Um, some indigenous communities are actively writing down um, their, um, you know, indigenous knowledge so that it can be passed down um, from generation to generation. Uh, but it's also something just, so I wrote a book, which I think I have in, I, hold on one second. I did bring it in here. Okay. So I don't know if you can see that. Sorry, I have the, kind of hard, oh, there we go. <laughs> so I wrote a book called Invisible Reality, um, Storytellers, Story Takers, and the Supernatural World of the Blackfeet. And in that particular book, one of the things I actually um, wanted to share and tell was that, you know, a hundred years ago, um, Blackfeet elders were telling 
um, ethnologists, what we would call anthropologists, but back then were called ethnologists, um, stories and they were specifically telling them i'm telling you this story because i want it to be left um behind so that the next generation will be able to hear this story when i'm gone and uh one of the things that i tried to do when i wrote that book is i actually went to a lot of archives because i was trying to uncover like you know um some of the stories that are in a museum how did they get there right um and oftentimes, most oftentimes, there was, they were left there intentionally. They were left there on purpose. Um, people got interviewed because they wanted to be interviewed. People got interviewed because they wanted to leave behind this, this information for the next generation. And so in that particular case, a hundred years ago, um, they were tape recorded. Well, I say tape recorded. <clears throat> they weren't tape recorded. They were um, actually recorded. Um, they were rec recorded on a different device. They were recorded and then those recordings were transcribed and written down. Um, and then um, that writing was taken back to the original person who they interviewed and they actually went over it. And they said, I'm gonna read this to you and you tell me if I got it correct, if it's correct. Um, and then the person who was interviewed had the, could then correct things. Um, and so this was done 100 years ago, right? And so part of the book, I tell that story of how this knowledge was told, told 100 years ago. And then um, I was actually told um, by several elders on the Blackfeet Reservation to write down their stories um, because uh, they were afraid that the knowledge would be lost unless it had been written down and shared. Um, and so part of the book that I actually wrote was about kind of that process of writing down stories, but it was also telling stories. Um, so I do tell a lot of stories in the book um, that now other people um, are reading. Um, I think that the most um, positive, like the, the most positive um, feedback that I've gotten um, for this book is I have heard from many um, uh, religious leaders um, who have read it and said, yes, this is great, you know, and they're very happy that I wrote down a lot of the stories. And of course, they know a lot of the elders that I talk to and um, who are in the book. So um, I think it depends on the community about transmitting oral, oral stories, writing down oral stories, and, um, and then publishing it in a book, right? <clears throat> and um, it just depends on the community. Some communities do not want their community to do that. Um, and others do. Um, so the ones that do are, are usually very vocal about it or they write it down themselves. And there are some communities that have a lot of written um, history. Uh, and um, there are some, even here in the state of Montana, there are, uh, there's one tribe um, that actually works with a, a, a national um, a academic press to write down um, a lot of their history and get it published. So that's a good question. Um, that is a really good question because I think there, um, again, there's kind of, it, it, uh, it depends on the indigenous community um, and uh, whether or not they want their oral history written down, um, published, uh, shared um, or not. Um, so thank you for that question. So Rosalind, I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna actually take advantage of this moment here and, and ask you, do a first a comment and a question from my own part here. And I'm gonna, I've got this kind of funny backlighting thing, but I'll see if I can hold it here and hold this up a little bit here. Um, it's so interesting to me, Rosalind, you and I are both colleagues in the same program, the Environmental Studies Department um, there and program and what we've come there through such very, very different routes. And I've learned so much tremendously from being a colleague of yours in here. I have these, I grew up on the West Coast, but both of my parents are from Minnesota. And they, um, and it's so interesting. I was so glad you used the term myth-making or Montana myth-making because as a scholar of religion, I talk about myths has multiple meanings. And one of them is simply that something that's not true but right. and probably more importantly, our stories that are, are, are sacred in the sense they tell us where we've come from, who we are and where we're going so oftentimes. And, and I, 
what I learned is what I thought was history growing up really turned out to be myth making in, in, in a deeper sense. Mm -hmm. So I remember really well, I visited my grandparents in Minnesota for the first time when I was seven. And they had on their wall a farm, they lived outside of Mankato about 20 miles. And on the wall of their farm, they had a lithograph and it was of the mass hanging of the Dakota uh, people in Mankato at the time, which I knew nothing about. And what I didn't realize until years later was that we started our family story with homesteading. All right, that was where our story started the way we would tell it. We told nothing about how we actually got land, access to that land. That land just suddenly magically became available to hardworking Scandinavians who homesteaded. That my grandfather was a railroad engineer. He built a railroad bridges for the Great Northern Railroad. He built them all the way across the northern part there. He fell in love with Montana and particularly fell in love with what well, became Glacier National Park. He was actually there before it was a park in that area there. Brought that back. My, my, my mother's sister was actually born in Montana Zoo. But, but as a result of that, my mother worked at Many Glacier Hotel in Glacier National Park in the 1940s. Well, a generation later, four of her six kids, we all went out and we worked in Glacier National Park in the summer there here. I went out there at age 18 and had absolutely no idea that Glacier National Park, one, bordered the Blackfeet Nation, and secondly, had been taken from the Blackfeet Nation. And so, so much of my family history, my family story was told in such a way that it made completely invisible the original inhabitants in that area there. And still to this day, um, you know, I think the vast majority of people who go to Glacier have no idea about their relationship to the Blackfeet. So that's a long-winded way of simply saying that I think that framing this as, as myth is so important because myths can be sacred stories, but they can also be stories that we use then to, to change those stories as we get more information. But what, the question I wanted to ask though for someone, and, I, and this is unfair in the sense of putting you on the spot, I'm not asking you to speak for all Blackfeet by any means. And yet I'd love if you could share some insight, what, it, what is it like as a relationship for the Blackfeet Nation today to border Glacier National Park in that kind of, you know, the having partly a, a, an economically dependent relationship on the park there, but also having being a place that people pass through all the time to get to the park. That's, that's a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's a long answer. Uh, you know, yeah, I grew up next to the park and, um, and uh, it's, it's really a love, hate, hate relationship. <laughs> so on the one hand, it's our land. Mm -hmm. I talk to any Blackfeet, they're gonna say that's our land. Um, the Blackfeet still use it as if it's their land. So things like going and gathering plants, Etc. You know, people still go and use it, um, uh, but it, but we don't have control over it. Um, and so, on the one hand, you know, I mean, I think if you talk to a lot of indigenous people, on the one hand, you know, indigenous people are like, we're going to wait you out. You know, we're going to be here. We're always going to be here. We're not leaving. Um, so when Amer I mean, people, uh, FYI, I'm sorry when I'm saying this, but in the last political election, like there's all kinds of crazy memes on native Twitter, just to let you know, um, where people are like, let's let America explode, then we'll still be here, you know. Um, <laughs> so there's kind of a philosophy of like, we're still going to be here uh, you know, when all of this goes away. Um, so I mean, I say, so, so, you know, I mean, I think that people think it's their, I mean, everyone's, it's our land. Um, and so people don't feel like there has been a relinquishing um, of, of, of land um, to make it Glacier Park. Um, I think that it, it's, uh, we don't want it to become like other parks and other areas where a, a reservation is right next to the park um, and, um, and a lot of uh, people purchase land on the reservation um, to live there. Uh, and so I know there's a real push for that, that not to happen. Um, I think, I, I don't think that we're really that economically 
connected to the park because the majority of the economy of the Blackfeet Reservation is agriculture. It's still agriculture and um, and uh, natural resource development. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's I. That's about all I'm going to say. I mean, it's just kind of a long. <laughs> no, I, if I follow up, I you know, in, in one ways, I think this this past summer would have been an absolutely fascinating place in the sense because of COVID, the east oh, yeah. side of the park was closed to visitation, and I just think about how different the rhythm of life must have been both for the people living there and also the native flora and fauna who simply had a sabbatical year in some sense from the massive visitation that always comes into that area. Yeah, no, it was very nice. So I was there all summer long. It was really nice not to have tourists. It was so nice. Um, so for those of you in the classroom, what happened was on the east side um, where Glacier National Park connects with the Blackfeet Reservation, um, the Blackfeet Tribal Council um, closed um, the border and said that uh, Glacier Park could not open their border to the Blackfeet Reservation for fear um, of the spread of COVID-19. Um, I, I think it was very shocking to the park um, that the tribe would do that. Um, and then the park just kind of said, okay, well, I guess we'll just deal with it. And they opened the west side of the park, but not the east side of the park. And um, it was, um, so I live literally, I don't know, uh, five minutes from the park border um, in the summertime. So it was really nice not to have any tourists at all um, uh, on the reservation um, during the summer. Um, because sometimes, I mean, I don't know, like other parts of Montana, it can, you can get uh, overwhelmed by uh, tourism as an industry, so. <laughs> hey, thanks, Ros. I think we had, I think we have time for one more question here and we've got someone at the microphone here. Or yeah, comment. Ray, What's that? I think Ray might have his hand up. I don't know if he wants to ask a question. Yeah, can we get one from Zoom land? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Ray, go give us a Zoom question and we'll take time for two questions in here and then we'll close up. Go ahead, Ray. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. LaPierre, it seems organizations like Audubon Club, Sierra Club are predominantly white and male. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of an organization on, on a national scale or even on a statewide scale of native ecologists, environmentalists, uh, because after all, we are the original ecologists and environmentalists. And do you ever get, do you ever have the opportunity for government agencies to ask for your expertise in traditional ecological knowledge on making decisions on use of land? Because we've lived there on that land for eons and we, we know it the best. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think one of the readings that I gave you kind of mentioned, I think, um, mentioned um, uh, some of the research, I mean, there's been recent um, research that's been done on um, conservation organizations, um, you know, conservation organizations, the staff is overwhelmingly white, um, probably not overwhelmingly male, but a significant amount male. Um, uh, conservation organizations are beginning to recognize that as an issue. Um, and so they're beginning to try to address that in various ways. Um, conservation organizations, I'll say a couple of things and then I'll, uh, cause we don't have much time. Um, you know, conservation organizations have, I unfortunately have a history of asking for free labor um, from uh, non-white people. Um, and I have often been asked for free labor uh, where a large, you know, you know, multinational, international NGO who is a bill, got billion dollars in the bank, no joke, um, will ask me to work for them for free. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't do that. Um, uh, so, so there's still those tendencies, right? Ask non-white people to work for free, but we're going to hire like a white consultant who's, we're going to pay them, you know, $100,000. Um, so anyway, so that's an issue still that still exists. Um, so, but there are some um, uh, native organizations um, that address um, it, uh, environmental issues um, and some that uh, are just in general kind of, you know, I, I would say that organizations such as ACES, which is the American Indian Science and Engineering Society has increasingly done more environmental stuff, SACNIS, 
um, which is the Society Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, um, has a um, in, um, environmental arm. Um, so there's some national organizations that do stuff. It's not the same, not the same as the large conservation organizations um, that have um, hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars um, in the bank. There's power in money. One last one from Aiden here. Go ahead, Aiden. Yeah, hi, Rosalind. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'll make this quick. Um, kind of a theological question, though. I was wondering if you could give me or give us a snapshot of how um, Blackfeet worldview and Christian missionaries um, on the reservation kind of can coexist, or even if they do coexist, um, even now. Um, I'll try to make it as sure as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a great book that was written um, in the 1970s called Mission Among the Blackfeet. Um, it was written by a, a, a theologian from uh, Yale University um, who went to Yale Divinity School. He, I think he did an excellent job. Even he did his research in the 60s. It was published in the 70s. Um, I thought he did a really excellent job of explaining kind of the complexities um, between um, different religions on the reservation. And then more recently, there was uh, somebody here at the University of Montana um, who just did his master's thesis on Pentecostalism, uh, the history of Pentecostalism on the reservation. Um, so historically, um, there, the main uh, Christian sect that's on the Blackfeet reservation is Catholicism. Um, Catholicism came to Western Montana in the 1840s. Um, it's the longest uh, uh, Christian group that's been in what is now Montana, um, and uh, and they have a a, a very um, uh, strong um, uh, relationship with many um, uh, Native people, um, and a lot of Blackfeet are Catholic. Um, the second uh, major uh, Christian religion is um, fundamentalism or Pentecostalism. Um, uh, on the on the Blackfeet Reservation, and that actually came through the Crow Reservation. So Pentecostalism came from the South. It came from Los Angeles, which had a very strong uh, four-square Pentecostal movement, uh, moved up to the Crow Reservation, which then spread to all the other reservations. Um, so those are the two main um, groups um, that are on the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, and then I would argue the next major kind of quote-unquote religion religion, if you could call it that, is atheism. Um, there's a large number of Blackfeet now who are atheists. Um, and then kind of the last, the fourth major religion is uh, Blackfeet um, uh, uh, traditional practices. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a history between all, uh, 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 between all of that. I think the closest relationship is Catholicism with, um, with Blackfeet um, religious practice only because it's very similar. And I, I'd have to give a whole lecture on that. It is very similar in terms of belief system, um, very similar in terms of understanding the way the universe works. Um, and uh, and the uh, religion that has the most conflict um, with the Blackfeet is Pentecostalism. So Pentecostalism has um, a different um, philosophy um, about other, um, religion. So for example, and I actually, Dan could probably answer this question um, just as well. So Catholicism um, sometimes um, allows for um, there be, to be a blending um, sometimes between kind of Catholicism and an indigenous tradition. So there's a little bit more like syncretism. Um, Pentecostalism does not allow that at all. Um, Pentecostalism um, is uh, you are Christian or you're not. Um, you're a Christian or you're a sinner, you know, you're a Christian or you're going to hell. Um, and so anybody who practices um, Blackfeet um, cultural tradition uh, is not uh, welcome. Um, and if they speak the Blackfeet language, not welcome, um, et cetera. So there's kind of a, a real um, conflict um, between those two religious practices. And if people who convert um, to, uh, uh, to fundamentalist um, Christianity um, really uh, struggle to, um, ha you know, be separate from those two religious practices. So that, sorry, that took a little longer than I thought it oh, was going to take. You answered that beautifully. And Ros, 
Father, I'm going to end on one thing here and see if I can just be pointed here. This is obviously a course on Montana, Montana narrative, but one of the things I really appreciated was how you showed in the readings you assigned and how you talked about an idea that be, has begun here has been really, really influential. So this is probably a hard book to see right here, but this is a book called Conservation Refugees by Mark Dowie. And what he does is he documents is what has happened with the preservation model that began the Teddy Roosevelt, the conservation movement, Yellowstone, Glacier, Yosemite Parks, and spread worldwide. And he estimates mm -hmm. or documents that at least 25 million indigenous people have been displaced from their homelands in the name of conservation and preservation around the world. So while we can mm -hmm. focus on what's happened here in Montana, that's really critical, the ideas that began here have spread to a global conservation paradigm that has displaced indigenous peoples all over the globe. And they have, and I, one of the things I really appreciate, Rosalind, when you talked about in the podcast that we listened to is the bad science that has gone behind that. That, that this is yeah. it's not, it's not only just political or religious, it's bad science in terms of conservation. So you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to talk about. We will be spending our time on Thursday ruminating on this here, but I want to just ask people to join me one more time in thanking Rosalind for really an outstanding lecture tonight. Well, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just I'll just encourage you to on Thursday when you have your discussion, you know, I think um, I think it's really important to find solutions to this, right? I mean, I think it's really, it's one thing to point out the problems. I mean, and I'll say it's easy to point out the problems, um, but it's another thing to try and find solutions to those problems. And I think it'd be, um, I think, and I think it's um, uh, unfortunately on the next generation to create some of those solutions and figure out ways to um, solve some of the problems that unfortunately, right? The Teddy Roosevelt's of the world created. Um, and so um, that's something to think about and think about how, um, uh, as you guys move forward in this class to uh, constantly think again, think about you know, what stories are being told and who has the privilege to tell that story and, and what do they get out of telling that story. So thank you again. Thank you so much and good night, Rosin. Yep, good night. Thank you.